Google him. What's the best advice that Joe, the million dollar man's ever given you? It's a great question. Mm-hmm. Um, the best advice he ever bestowed upon me was probably the fact that there is a millionaire and billionaire in every single category. And so, so many people get uh, kind of caught up on the, uh, you know, what am I going to be? What am I going to do? I mean, is it going to be insurance? Is it going to be this, that, that? Like, who am I? And what am I going to do to be the guy that I want to be? Mm-hmm. And what he kind of did was alleviate that for myself because he said, look at the world. He's like, there is a millionaire selling TVs. There is a billionaire, you know, selling uh, the, the trash king of New York, billionaire trash king of New York. He's like, it really isn't about, you know, you can literally choose any vehicle that you want. They're all going to make it to California. So just pick one. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, and it, it relieves a lot of the stress of, you know, oh, I got to be a doctor. I got to be a lawyer. I got to be, and, uh, and that was probably the most impactful thing that he ever said to me, because at the time in my life, Um, That was a big question for myself was, you know, who who am I? What am I going to do? I think a lot of people deal with that. Hey guys, welcome back to the Millennial Mentality Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Agnelli, here with your co-host, Peter Price. Yep. And this is Chandler Coven. Yeah. Hey. As always, guys, thank you for watching, listening, viewing, and subscribing. Continue to tell your family and friends about us, guys. It means the world. Uh, your support through this journey is awesome. So we appreciate that, and we just want to continue to grow and spread our message. So thank you guys so much for that. Um, today we have Chandler on, and Chandler has somewhat of a wild story, but a story I want to dive into because there's so many different pillars to it. Um, but I want to kind of bring it back to... I think originally where you guys met and kind of your upbringing here in South Florida. We go way back. Yeah, yeah right? Yeah. Bach? Bach. Yeah. Yeah. We did um, uh, baseball uh, with Fuck. Coach Conboy. Damn. Yep. R.I.P. Coach Conboy. Yes. He's literally dead? Yeah. 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 Can- cancer got him. Wow. Yeah. R.I.P. Coach Conboy. Yeah. He's friends Good with uh, Jay Cutler. And no he shit. Was, he was pretty involved in the bodybuilding community. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Good was guy. huge? Yeah, fucking swole. Yeah, massive, yeah. massive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We put five dollar bills on his shoulder. <laughs> he couldn't even reach it. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, guy was Jack. Really good guy. So, what did you go to Bach for? Uh, I went for theater. Okay. Um, and then I also went to the art school after that, which was Dreyfus. Okay. And then I did communications and speech and film work and things like that. Okay. So, um, now, so communications was a uh, what did we call it in high school? A uh, you know, in high school, we had like magnet. a magnet. Was it like a magnet? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. You had to audition for both the schools. So uh, for Bach, you had to do the audition. I did that for theater. So you had like a script that you did, and then yeah. communications, you did a speech, and then you brought in a little video or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, it was a whole qualification process. Yeah. And then I got in. So awesome. Was, How was your experience yeah. there? Good, good. Yeah. I mean, it was a very liberal, very arts, artsy school. Yeah. Um, it was great because you got to meet, you know, a whole lot of really intelligent people. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, a lot of the skills that I use now, you know, kind of stemmed even from, you know, Bach, yeah. you know, middle school. Like, What made you switch majors from middle school to high school? I wanted to see if I could. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to see if I was a, a one-trick pony or if mm-hmm. I could do both of them. And I just told myself, like, I could absolutely fucking do it. Yeah, and so yeah, yeah. and what it. was, like, your interest in going the communications route? What were you hoping to do with that? Um, I thought that theater helped to, like, kind of break you open and, like, not be shy about things and, like, you know, talk and, you know, that kind of stuff. But communications was a little bit more structured and more applicable to real life in mm-hmm. the form of, you know, organizing, you know, your speeches and, you know, things like uh, the different media platforms like uh, film and uh writing and i just thought that that was more in line with what i might be doing in college or something like that tell people what like communications entailed like what was that as a major what did that do so i mean it, it's as, as broad as the definition is you know communications is all forms of communications whether that be film uh speaking to somebody speech writing speech delivery um like a uh, news anchor type thing. news anchor yeah, yeah big time i mean yeah, you know yeah. in, the, in the school you know most schools have that news anchor thing but we took that thing real seriously yeah, yeah, i mean yeah. we had you know professional equipment and so there's editing involved audio editing film editing um picture yeah, I bet editing. your school announcements were fire 
Yeah, well, I mean, it's still high school, yeah, so it's yeah, not like yeah. super like pro pro level, but yeah. like yeah, we put in like a lot more effort than yeah. you know. Your it was probably level. better than Dwight's. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Remember the short films they used to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah those are great, man. Um, so you got done with with high school. Uh, as far as like your personal life throughout high school, what was that journey like? Good. I had a lot of fun. Um, I think when I was in middle school. I, I like started off pretty strong and being like pretty social and stuff. Mm-hmm. Then I had like a little you know blip where I went down like a almost like a computer rabbit hole where mm-hmm. like I, I wanted to like learn about programming and all this stuff. So I got like less social in middle school and then you know when I verged into high school, that's when I was like, all right, I really want to party. Like mm-hmm. yeah. started uh, partying a whole lot um, and then uh, I had a great time. I had a great yeah. time in high school. Um, and it's just, it's just a good school and good people to be around. Like, even connections, like, today, like, from that school, like, all those are, like, valuable connections. Yeah. It's not like I, I can look back on any of those connections I made in high school and go, oh, oh fuck, why did I spend my time with yeah. that guy? Like, Well, that's kind of when I remember, like, reuniting with you was in high school and, like, when I was spending a lot of time with Blake Coriati. And, oh, yeah. And to be honest, this wasn't the best... <laughs> yeah, yeah. It wasn't the best phase of my life. I was yeah. selling drugs and doing bad things, but... Um, yeah. You know, occasionally me and Chandler would link up at a party, you know, yeah. and, um, and are, is Blake your cousin? So, are you related somehow? So, well, okay, so we, I didn't know that we weren't related until like teenage years. Yeah. So we were really close, and I'll still refer to him as my cousin. Yeah. And, uh, you know, his dad, my uncle, you know, et cetera, but, you know, no biological connection. Gotcha. But we've just known each other since literally like birth. Right. So. so I used to spend a lot of time with Blake, obviously, and, um, that's maybe that's why I didn't remember the middle school times because of all the dumb shit I was doing in high school. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's like kind of I, when I remember reuniting with Chandler for sure. Does yeah. uh, Dreyfus party? Dreyfus does yeah. um, in weird ways. I think the best part about being in Dreyfus, if you do it correctly, is the fact that you get exposed to so many different areas of Palm Beach County. Yeah. Since everybody comes from different areas, typically everybody you know has friends at Dwyer, friends at you know. Uh, with someone down south, Palm Beach Central, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, Lakes, all the different yeah. schools. So, you know, if you get it, you know, in touch with the right people, you can, you know, experience all of the schools. Correct. Yeah. Um, actual Dreyfus pure parties were fun, but not like let's line up fucking, you know, yeah. coke and just fucking rail. You know, it, it was it was just fun, like yeah. just pure fun. Like I don't know. Like you said, it was, it was artsy. That like, like uh, the theater program in middle school, like you felt like would sort of break you out of your shell. Is that something? Like, yeah. did you were you kind of a shy kid prior to that? No, actually, I mean the, the reason why it kind of gravitated towards it was because I was totally not shy, yeah. and so I, I was like, well, you know, I'm gonna really, really excel in this, mm-hmm. and I thought I'd just get better at it, yeah. um, and uh, and it did. I mean, you know, it, you, have you ever been to like a speech class in college or something? Yeah, one. It's kind of unnerving, and so yeah. you know, when you're young like that, it's even worse. Yeah. And the first day, they throw you up in front of the entire class, and they basically say fucking dance for us yeah, yeah. yeah do, do some do something <laughs> funny and that is just the most shocking thing in the universe to do you know as a i don't know what is it 10 11 12 yeah, year old man. kid so it definitely broke you out of your shell pretty quick so if i tell you you're going to a pop dance what dance are you doing i feel like you're like a disco guy yeah Damn, dude, I don't even really know i don't like, have a lot like of moves first day of college class or they they tell you to go up and do no music give me a five second dance what are you doing well, now the first thing that comes to my head is the disco move because <laughs> it's all that I've got for I you. can see maybe the Scooby thing. Yeah, that's a good one, yeah, too. Yeah, I don't yeah. have a lot. No. Have you, you ever seen, um, fuck, I can't even think of them. I want to say maybe it's like something about Mary or some shit. Okay. It's like the fax machine. Oh, oh, oh maybe uh, Chuck, not Chuck and Larry. Um, Hitch? Maybe. Maybe Q tip, Q tip. Yeah, yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. Stir the sauce. Stir the yeah, Sorry. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Just triggered. Um,. Okay, Kevin uh, James growing up. I was called, uh, believe it or not, I was called, um, what was that? Oh, Mall Cop in high okay. school? Yeah, Paul Blart. Paul Blart. Yeah, Paul I was Blart. called Paul Blart uh, by most of the football team, actually the whole football team. So, That's fucked up. Uh, pretty fucked up, but it's okay. I'm not uh, scared by it. Anywho, um, to you, though, when you got done with high school and you had this blanket of you know things you could do mm-hmm. and things to attack, how did you hone in on, on one going into college? 
Well, so so my dad runs a law firm, okay. right? And so, you know, kind of all growing up, and that's kind of partially the reason why I wanted to do communications was the fact that, you know, that would structure me a little bit better for, you know, speech delivery and writing and all those skills that would kind of help, help you be a better lawyer. And so I was always like, oh, well, I'm just going to be a lawyer. Mm. And so when I entered college, that's kind of what I wanted to do. And then, um, weirdly, uh, I got into a relationship with a girl that, you know, I have kids now, what now yeah. with. she's my fiance hey. and, um, and my parents really didn't like that cause it kind of steered me away from school a little bit. Um, and, uh, we had a really, really bad relationship, me and my parents mm-hmm. because of that. And so it forced me to, uh, change directions almost entirely. Um, and I didn't know if I could say it on the podcast, like, uh, cause it's like legal stuff, but like, mm-hmm. um, like I made fakes. I made fakes. I don't know. Oh, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah. I think there's a statute well, of limitations. I don't know. That's, I mean, that's a heavier thing. So I, I don't know. So anyways, you I made schmig my mies. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. that. And, um, made Fake library cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I supported myself with that. And I had a great time in college with that. Cause obviously that's good income. Um, yeah, sick. and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's pretty smart round to go. Yeah. Supply yeah, demand is that's very good. high in college. Yeah, that's good. Oh yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's better than anything you could sell there. And, um, but, uh, but yeah, and then, you know, my fiance got pregnant. And so then I was, how old are you then? God, I was 20, something like that. Okay. Uh, Young. And were you away at school at that time? Yeah. Yes. And we had to come home. Was that FGCU? Yeah. And we had to come home. And, uh, once we were home, you know, I was, you know, drop out of college and, you know, what am I going to do? Am I going to be Starbucks? Like, I, I don't know what I'm, you know, I have Mm. to support a family now. Yeah. And so that's what kind of got everything kicking into high gear to, you know, go do something. And I just kind of brute force attacked it. I, I took the money from, you know, the IDs Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I bought a repo trailer down in uh, Fort Lauderdale, which is just, you know, a shit, you know, landscape trailer with shit equipment in it. I didn't even know how to cut lawns or anything, but I was like, okay, if there's something I can figure out, it's probably going to be this. And so, um, there's a whole, you know, life cycle there of me learning, you know, all this stuff and going up to these doors, not knowing even know how to cut a lawn and just knocking and say, Hey, can I do your lawn? Yeah. Yeah. And negotiating prices and stuff. And so, you know, that kind of just snowballed into, you know, getting it bigger and bigger and bigger and learning all kinds of new stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, there's different dynamics of the business that make more money and you, you, you probably experienced that. Squeeze your margins some places and open them up others. Yeah. Hiring employees, dealing with machinery, loans, getting an LLC started up, get insurance for it. I mean the whole nine, like I went through the whole life cycle. Um, and yeah, I mean, it eventually got me to the place like a successful place yeah. where I didn't have to work anymore. Yeah. Um, or no, no, I, I had to work. Like yeah. I'm, I'm the owner. I have to bring, I, I got to kill the you fish. You didn't have to do labor home. anymore. Yeah. I didn't have to do labor. Yeah. And so, um, and yeah, and then, you know, you meet a lot of cool people like yeah. that, just like with any business. Um, and you gravitate towards the smarter people yeah. and they help you out a little bit. And, uh, then that's when I got the opportunity to acquire the larger business. Um, there's a whole story behind that. And I just, I don't want to like, uh, we got keep, time. How, yeah. long, how long was the like door to door? You running the show by yourself face that, uh, probably about a year and a half Yeah, and longer than I would have wanted to, but sure. I didn't have like part some, of the process though. Yeah, no, there was a lot of head bumps and a lot of lost money and, you know, just scraping by like in the beginning mm-hmm. because, you know, goal number one was just to employ yourself, you know, at the same pay rate as, you know, you would somewhere else. Yeah, but then you realize all the extra costs and then what the going rates are for things. And uh, so, yeah, I bumped my head like a million fucking times uh, on all kinds of shit and door knocking. We would go, you know, entire weeks just door knocking, bringing mm-hmm. the truck around and going, hey, $50 right now, I'll cut your lawn. Like, yeah. And uh, and we learned a lot from that. I mean, yeah. when you do brute force stuff like that and just attack it and bump your head a million times, it's sometimes like the best learning that yeah. you can possibly do. So. Yeah. Um, that accelerated me really fast, but on like a good day, how many lawns would you do during that time? The yeah. door knocking, um, well, it, as we were kind of snowballing there, you would collect more and more accounts. And mm-hmm. so, you know, your, your average would get higher, but like if it was just door knocking, what was being produced off the door knocking, maybe three lawns, uh, maybe a total of like 200 something dollars, um, which is you know, peanuts when you remove gas and things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then you scrape up one account and since that's recurring revenue, that kind of, you know, helped steam right. the ship forward. Yeah. Um, but then, uh, then I got introduced to all kinds of 
cool stuff that just exploded it. So that, that was kind of like a bumpy period. And then once I really started clicking in, that's when everything just jumped because, you know, knowledge is everything. Yeah. And so once you got the keys, you know where to put put the shit in, hey, then, nice. you're, then you're fired up. So It's funny because I, I think what people fail to realize is like, business ownership or whatever you want to call it entrepreneurship the whole game is figuring it out there is no rule book there is no blueprint there is no nothing telling you what to go how to go about it what to do pete has questions of himself about his business i have questions of myself about my business i'm sure you do as well and what is cool about it though is in the beginning there's so much to figure out that once you start to get things in place and things are kind of passive as far as the cash flow then the other things that you get to figure out are fun. You know, yes. okay, now I have this nest egg. Now where do I put it? Where do I move it? Do I reinvest in a company? Do I reinvest in another one? Do I acquire one? There's so many different options. But then the figuring out bullshit turns into figuring out cool shit. Yes. And, and that's when things accelerate. You know, and that's the overnight success. Or, oh my God, how did Chandler get that that quick? It wasn't that quick. You were door knocking for 18 months before that happened. But then they just saw the back end of the figuring it out. No, no one, no one ever sees, you know, how much stuff you yeah. got to do just to come up with this simple fucking answer. Yeah. And if someone were to give you that simple answer, it would take two fucking seconds, and you you wouldn't even probably value the information Correct. given to you. Right. But God, yeah, like like that whole year worth of information, I could flip over to you in a second, yeah, yeah. and. Uh, and it just seems so easy or so yeah. obvious, but it took that much time, and it, it's never stopped. I mean, yeah. as as the business you know uh, life cycle has grown, like that has never stopped. Yeah. I just went you know ten thousand dollars deep and you know three weeks worth of you know uh, rumbling and tumbling through different yeah. you know uh, contractors just to find out an answer that I really wanted, yeah. and it was a ten thousand dollar answer that I wanted yeah, yeah, yeah. and I could give it to you like that but it was hard as fuck to get that yeah. get get that answer yeah. Yeah. and it doesn't stop so yeah. but um so but you I, said you wound up acquiring a, a larger landscaping business down the road yeah well okay so so a little bit uh, better description of that is so I got the opportunity to acquire that business um, the owner wanted to be kind of an absentee owner and I found out a little bit later that the business wasn't doing so well financially. Yeah. And so the whole the whole lure of it for me was, okay, you can either put the gas pedal on my business or I can go and try to acquire this business, which he's offering me, which is the very first time I've ever yeah. been exposed to you know acquiring a business. So this is like hot yeah. stuff for me. And, what what uh, state was your business in at this time? This is Florida. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm sorry, not like the actual location, but like how many employees and like what uh, condition was your business in at that time? Good, solid. I was I was very happy. I was I was almost fat and resting on my laurels yeah. level happy. You and had was, a few employees. Yep, I had three full timers, um, and they were doing everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and then I had a bunch of subcontractors that I would bring in for like you know days that we'd have you know heavier work on the weekends and stuff, and we needed you know just extra staff. Um, but uh, but no, the ship was cruising good I would do maybe 10 quotes a week um, I paid you know roughly about twelve hundred dollars a month on leads and I would just basically go around and give quotes out and just fill the pipeline for the boys and you know keep them running on the lawns and it was going real well like I mean I, I was buying cars I was buying motorcycles I was, I was living like a king <laughs> and uh, and no it was a big you know take on to try to you know take on the acquisition of this company um, and, uh, you know, all, all bad things come with, you know, positive yeah. highlights. And it got me exposed to a lot of things that I wouldn't have been exposed to. But it was it was kind of a bad deal. Like, I got into that. Um, but I got to experience what it was like to manage, you know, 16 guys, uh, you know, three or four different crews, um, foremen, managers, you know, the whole the recruitment. Um, You're doing the whole song and dance. Everything. Yeah. And so, um, and then and not only that, but by running that big of a company, um, I got to meet a whole lot of uh, very valuable inter individuals, and that's the people who kind of are guiding me right now. Yeah. Um, and so, so no, like that that whole experience was super valuable to me because that's when I met Joe, and mm -hmm. Joe's the guy with the two hundred fifty million dollar fund, um, and he is just a plethora of knowledge. Yeah. I mean, the guy IPO'd on Wall Street. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. How many people you run across say, <laughs> you know, like I yeah, would, I would own a shirt if I did that. That's yeah. <laughs> I, I ran a billion dollar company yeah. what do you want to ask me yeah, like, yeah, yeah. and um and then you know my my other guy who i work for right now 
and uh, he mm-hmm. owns the largest independent insurance agency in Florida. Okay. And so this guy's big swinger, mm-hmm. and uh, he's just wildly intelligent. So just good people to be around yeah. now. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I think sharks always recognize sharks, and I'll call myself a shark here. But shark meaning. I mean, if you know, you know, it's like someone who always wants more, someone who's driven, someone who wants to write their own story, not someone else's, an entrepreneur type vibe, uh, and just a go-getter, a figure-outer, whatever. It's a shark to me. Mm -hmm. And I think when you recognize sharks growing up and as you get older, even in your 40s and 50s, if you see a young one, it's almost like a younger version of yourself. And I think that's why those mentorships always get attracted. It's because, you know, if I'm 50, God willing, and I'm successful and like that, but I see a 26-year-old kid... I want to say, wow, like, let me, I, for no char, I mean, I'm, I made my success, mm-hmm. but I just want to see you grow now, you know, and I oh, think yeah. a lot of that happens, and a lot of people think if someone's of status, they don't want to help, but if they truly are self-made, they want to help a lot, yeah. because they know that feeling of, you know, I grew this shit from nothing, it was a baby business, now it's IPOing, and, and you know, it gives you that belief and that possibility of, like, these people are human, you know, and then you yes. go out and grab drinks with them, and you're like, oh, he cusses and moves like I do. You know? Oh, yeah, you know? no, absolutely it, you know? no difference between me and That's you. That's it. They just got a billion bucks in their That's pocket. That's it, and a you know. F load of knowledge. Correct, like, you know. Deserved knowledge, Correct, too. you know, and then when your temperature's around them, your identity starts to raise. You know, oh, you, big time. you walk out of those meetings and those dinners at these fancy restaurants with these fancy people with mm-hmm. your chest kind of puffed out, going back to these oh, yeah. peasants of the world, you know, but, and not in reality, that's a joke. What I'm saying is like, you feel that self aura of my worth is more, you yes. know, and, uh, you know, my charge an hour is more and what I bring to the table is more because now I have that unlimited asset of, of knowledge and experience and listening to what these guys, these big dogs are talking about. So mm-hmm. I don't think you should ever discount that, you know, a meeting with someone or a talk with someone or a discussion with someone, because if you hit it off, I've had a lot of opportunities and jobs and things come my way just from elevator talks and bumping into someone at Publix. And like, you know, if you're a dick and standoffish, no one wants to be around you. But if you sow some type of ray of light, something might come out of it, you know? Yeah. And if you were an asshole to this guy at first, he could have said, screw that kid and see you later. Oh, absolutely. Um, so sometimes what you're looking for is right in front of you. You just got to kind of dig for it. And uh, that's awesome. So now... You know, you acquired the second business. You're going through the struggles of that. Mm-hmm. I'm going to kind of rewind, though, uh, to your personal life. Sure. When you were 20, 21, you had a, your, your first child. Um, you moved back home. And what's the temperature of your relationship like with your, your uh, kid's mother at the time? Like, what was that whole, like? Cur- uh, currently or in the past? In the past. In the past, it was actually pretty good. I mean, because yeah. obviously, you know, we were in, you know, uh, love stage. It was bumpy, you know, getting the uh, notification that, you know, we were having a kid and yeah. all that. We were super young, so we didn't know how that was going to be received by our parents. And both of them kind of gave different uh, vibes vibes yeah. uh, off of the news. Um, but at the end of the day, we were just like, you know what, this is happening. Yeah. And so we got to figure out, you know, how best to approach it. Um, so there's a lot of stress and stuff, yeah. but I wouldn't say it like affected our relationship in any way. I'd say probably when the kids uh, started coming, that's when um, our personal relationship started to receive some challenges. Yeah. And that's just natural because, you know, neither one of us has, a, you know, experienced this before. Yeah. And so we don't know how to deal with it. Like, and, you know, we keep pushing, you know, this person takes care of this today and this person takes care of this. And then you get you know, resent from the other party if you don't do something. Yeah. And so, so it's definitely a new, it's like moving in with the girl for the first yeah, time. It's, yeah. it's just a new bump. Yeah. And are you going to get over that bump? And so, yeah. so we, we, we had that, but I, I got to say like from hearing like other people's stories on how that all went down, like mine was smooth. Yeah. So was there ever a thought of, you know, not having the original, the first kid, like when you guys are both in college or like, you Oh know, yeah. You know, you, you, like what was that thought of, okay, now we're having the baby. Um, oh God, uh, again, like, when I came on here, I was like, okay, how many things can I say, you know, that's, you know, not going to incriminate me forever yeah, yeah, yeah. or you know, whatever, <laughs> but I mean, I'll keep pretty open, like, cause it's just my story. Yeah. So it's, it is what it is. But like, uh, when she first got pregnant, um, her parents kind of, uh, kind of really steered her towards like, you know, abortion and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I remained, you know, just whatever you want like yep. this is your body like i'm i'm your team member i'm your supporter so you know like if you if i don't want to put too much of myself in in this because it's so much of you that's going on yeah. with it and so um ended up you know her parents kind of uh 
influenced her yeah. or you know gave her their, her two, their two cents Wisdom. of what to do yeah and so uh she did get an abortion so okay. our, my very first kid or run-in was uh, an abortion and then uh then only a couple months later, both of us were kind of mental wrecks because of what we just did, mm-hmm. uh, the, the life that could have happened or whatever, mm-hmm. that we ended up, you know, going back and we got pregnant again. Yeah, yeah. And uh, obviously we went through that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, and that one turned into Peyton and he's okay. my son. Um, he had a, a wild uh, birth story and everything. Mm-hmm. He, he went through a rough uh, birth and so he's he's autistic, um, and so uh, then just a couple of years later, um, I was being very successful, yeah, yeah. very successful at the yeah. time. I had empty rooms in my house, and I thought I was you know ready to take the fuck off. And I was like, you know what? Like, let's fill up the fucking house. Like, yeah. isn't this what you do when you get wealthy? Like, yeah. you know, you fill up the house. And so we got uh, my second kid, which is Everly, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, what is it? Got a little lost there. It's, it's heavy stuff. It's heavy like, stuff, yeah, man. You know. and, and and to you, Chandler, if I'm asking a question and it's pressing a nerve that you don't really want to talk about, just let me know. Oh, um, yeah, no, um, no. But the last question it. on it is, that just came to my mind, and I know it's really deep, but sure. when you had the second, the first child, but the second pregnancy, and mm-hmm. you went through with that, and that child was born, did it make you feel any type of uh, second guessing to the first child that you aborted? Yeah, actually, yeah. you know what? Actually, that's a huge conversation piece. Yeah. I mean, we even talk about that kind of stuff like today just because it's like what if type yeah. conversation. But at the end of the day, the, the, literally the one sentence that keeps us in line is if we didn't do that, then we wouldn't have ever got to experience this beautiful kid yeah. named Peyton. Yeah, yeah. And so at the end of the day, if I didn't do that decision, I wouldn't have got to experience this. So y- you can't really decide on that. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. I, I don't feel any regrets because, you know, I, this is the guy I know, yeah. and this is the guy I love. And um, but we talk about it all the time. We, yeah. we like to think about you know what what it could have been yeah. or whatever. But you know life life has a weird way of lining shit up. Like you know, and and sometimes you have a bumpy path, and that was just our you little, little the beauty in it. Yeah, exactly. What yeah. is it? What is it like being a father? Uh, what's your worldly view shift in perspective since being a, a father to an autistic son? Um, well, that, that's pretty wild. Cause like, you know, growing up, like you'll run into people with, you know, mental disorders or whatnot. And speaking, you know, directly to the, the autistic category, my impression of them when I was growing up was that they're a little bit, you know, socially awkward, yeah. which is I mean normal for mental illness or yeah. whatever. But, uh, they're also kind of dicky to me. Like, yeah, and, yeah. and I was, I was kind of abrasive. I didn't really like uh, mess with it too much. Yeah. And to be honest, I wasn't, you know, that great of a person to those yeah, people. Yeah. And, um, and now, I mean, y- you can't even talk about how yeah. you know flipped that's become now. Yeah. And I understand my son, you know, intimately yeah. and, uh, sure. He presents some of those traits, um, that it, I even, you know, back in the day, had a feeling towards, um, and now I understand them. I, yeah. know, I, I know where they come from, and I know why. And he's the sweetest kid on the face of this earth, yeah. and he just uh, has a tough time, you know, expressing it. And you know, people say that all the time, you know, that th- these kids have problems uh, expressing it. But like, yeah. when you're experiencing it on that level, and like how I know, like I know this kid, like since the first word yeah. he talked, like yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I know that his first thing that he liked, the yeah. first toy he liked. And so, you know, everything he does now, even if it seems like kind of funky or weird or abrasive, I'm like, I know exactly where he, what yeah. he's trying to get at. And mm-hmm. like, it's not dicky at all. It's actually really sweet. Like, so it's that's, not that his normal's wrong. It's just his normal's different than our normal. Or absolutely. Your normal. And like, you know, my, my sister used to have a quote above her bed. She's like, I'm not weird. I'm just not your normal. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's so true. You know, it's like in the older you get, you know, that's why adolescence is so hard is because you try to fit in. Then the older you get, you're like, it's cool to actually fit out. <laughs> you Absolutely. Know? It, it's, cool, it's cool to be my own person, be a tattoo artist who was a bartender and then turn his life into what he wanted to make it. And 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 cool to be, you know, from my shoes and your shoes and, and, and be different. And that's where the signature is. Yes. Um, and you take this mold of what society is and you kind of want to be outside of that um, because you don't really want to necessarily be like the else good bad or indifferent you just don't want to be like them you want to be your own entity Mm -hmm. um and so i I think it's really interesting because 
you know, to me, my entire life, like you, I'll, I'll admit that, you know, I, I viewed people who had type of mental illness and di disabilities as, um, I'm not going to say less than, but my immature brain didn't really receive it in a good light. Uh, and the older I get, you know, I think sometimes the most beautiful souls come from people like that because yeah. they're able to cultivate this outer worldly view of what they're seeing and how they're interpreting a totally it. different perspective it is you know and, and it and it brings you back to earth a gives you gratitude but b it makes you think that like you know love and respect and being kind to others uh, not knowing if they have conditions or not knowing what their upbringing was like uh, could pay dividends you know Absolutely. and and, and 20 times over to them than you if you're kind to someone like this they remember that tenfold more than your kindness to your you know to, to, to you delivering it so always be kind always love and you never know what someone has or is going through yeah. you know uh so when you had the second child and then you went through the trials and tribulations with that uh that was around the same time you had acquired the business mm -hmm. um and that's in full swing now, from a business aspect, was it your goal always to get out of landscape, or did you picture yourself owning landscape companies your whole life? That's funny. No, um, I got into landscaping because of necessity yeah. and because I thought I could do a good job in it. Um, but the entire time through landscaping, I was developing skills that were starting to, you know, open up doors for other industries and yeah. other, you know, verticals that I could be a part of. And so, you know, the direct thing that I did was I started taking the different pieces of the landscape industry and started, you know, expanding essentially my catalog of yeah. services so I could get, you know, exposed to new things just because it was so directly related. Yeah. But it wasn't until I met um, Joe, um, the, the, the $250 million yeah. man, that he really just busted my fucking head like wide open yeah. with this shit. And, uh, you know, he was the one who ingrained me with, you know, 90% of businesses are the same. Yeah. He's like the only reason why you're not a part of another industry that might, you know, and it's not like one's better than other or whatever. He's like, they're all just vehicles on a lot. We're all trying to get to California. Some are a little bit faster than others. You yeah. know, just, it's just another vehicle. We yeah. can all get to California. Yeah. And so, uh, but he said the reason why you don't feel like you're competent or, or, or you know, it's, it's literally just a knowledge gap. Yeah. You, you don't you don't know how to do that, therefore you're not doing it. So yeah. how about this? Let me expose you to a whole lot of things. Yeah. And through that exploration process, maybe you'll find something that makes really good sense to you. And so through that process, like we, we explored so much, like uh, he taught me so much about different businesses and how they're successful and what separates, you know, a millionaire from the, bill the billies, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, and it, I mean, it just fu mind fucked me. Like, like literally I would have headaches leaving his house <laughs> every single day. It was, it was literally that much information. I was literally having like migraine level headaches leaving it. It wasn't like I wasn't yeah, drinking yeah. water or anything. Yeah. It was just an overload of knowledge. Huh. Yeah. And how long did you get mentored by him? The, till this day. Okay. I, as a matter of fact, I actually, uh, I had a, uh, I, I was supposed to go to uh, dinner with him tonight. Okay. And, uh, I was like, oh fuck. I'm like, I, I made a commitment to the podcast. Yeah. I'm like, uh, so we'll, we'll reschedule it to, you know, next week. Yeah, but he's, yeah. he still mentors me even today. That's you know? awesome. Yeah, he's, he's literally an amazing guy. So like, what does he do? So, okay, God. All right, so he purposely, otherwise I would have pitched him to come here, um, but because uh, he's definitely my strongest contact, but he really does not want me to share too much about yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, he's been in several businesses, so, uh, I can tell you about his history. I can't tell you what he's doing now. Yeah. Um, but, and I'll explain later, but so, uh, he started a company called Credit Trust, uh, back in 1999. Um, it was kind of the start of, uh, debt collectors, yeah. right? So banks used to own their debt and try to collect on their own debt. He, uh, through some of his earlier businesses, established a relationship with a bank to where he purchased the debt from them. Then, you know, through his sales guys and his pri private company, they would go and collect on that debt. And so, you know, that just kind of compounded to a point of, you know, getting big enough to go IPO and, you know, um, really, you know, start having billions and billions of dollars worth of debt. And, um, and that company was amazing for him. And it, it, it catapulted him to, you know, a couple other businesses that he was a part of. Um, guys managed, you know, 4,000 employees at certain points. And uh, he stacked up a, you know, good fund and yeah. now you know him and his buddies you know play around with that fund and you know do all kinds of stuff with it buy buy businesses 
uh, invest in uh, stock options. Yeah. I mean, they're 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 playing. They're the in the big, playground now. They're in the big leagues. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. the big leagues. I mean, I even had a conversation with them. You know, I'm like, you know what? For as big as you are, shouldn't you own like a lot of properties? Like, isn't that what you do? Like, you diversify your portfolio, or whatever. Mm-hmm. He's like, quite honestly, it's not worth my time. Yeah. yeah. I'm like that's that's interesting because I just don't see how it wouldn't be worth your time. But then he broke it down and he was like, "Well, no, I make more money doing stock options and this and this." And mm. and I guess it does. I guess that's out of his plate now. He it's too little money for him. So it's kind of a weird conversation. Cool. You also yeah. have to be interested in it too, though. Like in my opinion, to mm. invest correctly, I mean, you could do the, your mutual funds and in your stocks and bonds and options. But as far as an aggressive type investment, I feel like you should be semi passionate or know information on X, oh, Y, and Z. Big time. You know, um, before you buy into a heavy IPO or or you buy several pieces of commercial real estate or land, you should do your homework and research. But you should also be passionate about it because now that's really what your you know asset is building to. Yeah. And I think at one point, like where Joe is now, you could really keep your options open. But not even the ROI, but more the passion is what drives him and, and most of his projects, I would oh, guess. Oh, big time. Um, so I think I'll always be like that. To me, real estate's always intrigued the shit out of me. I think it's really interesting and fun. But I know a lot of people who aren't really, you know, turned on by it. And they're like, you know, the risk isn't there. And you got to deal with people and this and that. But that's my business. So yeah. um, I always want to, you know, in my future endeavors, invest. Uh, just kind of a, a random question, but from you with your experiences of growing and having money, uh, and being 27 years old, what is your opinion on personal debt? Personal debt. Um, so some people would advise, listen, that's not bad. You know, go out and live your best life and, you know, buy a boat, you know, all on the, you know, on, on given money. Uh, buy that car, buy that house, acquire all these liabilities. Um, but, you know, debt is whatever. What, what is your opinion on debt? I got a very interesting perspective on that. Yeah. And, I, you know, who knows what's right and wrong. Yeah. I'll just tell you my experience with it and how I approached it. Um, but when it comes to debt, right, I used to uh, be the old school mentality of, you know, you don't want debt and, you know, keep as much cash on hand as possible. Then as I'm exposed to more and more knowledge on the subject, you know, it's kind of steered away from that to, well, why would you leave your money in a bank account where it's losing, you know, uh, it's getting eaten away by inflation yeah, yeah. and whatnot. So you want to park it in something that's appreciating. I don't care what it is. I mean, yeah. literally, you could park it in a physical asset and yeah. you know let it appreciate. Um, but uh, as far as debt, um, I'm all for literally accumulating as much debt as humanly possible. Yeah. I mean, um, let because th- that is going to be your access to additional funds I, I, to start up a business or to you know get quick money. I mean, this is your way to prove to the banks that you are a good, uh, I hope I'm using investment. the word right, a good investment, a yeah. good fiduciary of their money, you know, and, and you want the banks to be on your side uh, when it comes to loaning money. And yeah. so uh, the more you can play in that arena, <laughs> I think is only going to be beneficial to you, whether it's going to be your, you know, personal mm-hmm. uh, uh, debt or if it's going to be, you know, through a, a corporation yeah, or yeah, whatever yeah. else. I, I'm all for like literally overloading down mm-hmm. on it. I'm also a big fan of, uh, and this, this one's the higher controversy, yeah. But uh, I'm a big person that I like to uh, increase my expenses of living um, every time I, you know, they, they say, do not do that. Don't ever increase your things, uh, your expenses. Yeah. But every time I ex- increase my expenses, I got that feeling of, you know, back when I was starting the landscape company again, I'm like, oh, fuck, I got new shit to pay for. I got to figure out how to pay for it. Mm-hmm. And every single time I burst through that you made it happen. wall. Yeah, and, right. and, and then I was like, holy fuck, like, I had this capability last month and this month I'm doubling, you know, what I made. I'm right. not doing much different yeah. except for that little kick in the ass that told me I had new bills to pay. Yeah. So, you know, right or wrong, that was the product of it. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know if it's going to work for everybody, but it definitely worked for me. So What's clarify your- what you mean a little bit about the debt thing. Like, does that mean people should go and open up a credit card and run it up and you don't have to worry about paying it off or like what do you just what do you mean about accumulate as much debt as possible so this is an interesting conversation uh so basically 
and this is something I even want to learn a little bit better, right? And, mm-hmm. and Joe actually is the one who can tell me the most about this. And I learn about this all the time. Like this is supposed to be like a big and hard subject to understand. Um, but uh, what I would do is I would take these credit cards and I would constantly max them the fuck out. Mm-hmm. I'd max them out probably six times a month, uh, pay them off six times a month. And uh, I'll tell you that within two months or whatever, I suddenly get a letter and says, oh, hey, uh, we want to give you more money, right. more money, because you're you clearly are outspending this card. Like, let's give you more so that, you know, you got more skin, yeah. skin on the table. Then when I had a business and I was going for uh, financing on different equipment and different cards and everything, um, those were even easier to get a hold of. And the more and more that I got it, I was I was starting to get like shit surprised. I would I would go into these places like looking at a new mower or a new um, truck or whatever, and my credit score wasn't even like that buff. Like it was yeah. in the six hundreds after getting hit so many times with yeah. all this other shit that I was like, there's no fucking way that they're gonna like accept me on this shit. And oh my God, yeah. every single time I was getting accepted, accepted, <laughs> yeah. accepted. It's like if you were playing in their world, they were loving you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And as a 21 year old kid, like getting strapped down with like 70K worth of debt, like all, all kinds of different places, like I just don't see how you can do that, how you can get to that point doing it any other way. You know, mm-hmm. you gotta play with the system. Like you can't stay outside of the system, you gotta be in that system. Yeah. So. Again, I don't know the true math on it. That's that was my experience. I've heard things very similarly yeah. to that, and I kind I kind of lean and steer in that direction yeah. because of it. It's interesting. I don't disagree with you. I'm just playing devil's avocados here. Yes, because uh, <laughs> I, I was the same exact way. You know, uh, as Pete knows, you know, I year over year, the last five years, I've made significantly more money every year, and year after year, my expenses went up significantly with it. It was parallel. And uh, it was really tough this last year looking at all the, the, the money I made for that age and that time. I felt like I made a lot, but I had really nothing to say for it. I mean, I have depreciating assets like a truck and a boat and this and that. But as far as like, you know, skin in the game, like true skin in the game, I didn't own anything outright. I didn't, I didn't, I was still owned by the banks. I was still owned by this or that. Um, and I've done a lot of educating myself on it as of late. And there's some common denominators along people like, you know, the route you went, uh, you're building your credit really strong, really fast. It's an accelerated route. Uh, you're probably using it for your business, which I'm, yes. I'm doing the same thing as well. So you're able to spend more money than a, a usual personal life. Mm-hmm. Um, but where I'm at now is I, I want to pay off all the, the money I owe for everything completely debt free. And then I want to start getting paid, paying myself first, but that's getting paid into assets, into mm-hmm. the asset column. So I just read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And he great was a, book. yeah, it was a great book. And uh, he, you know, was an entrepreneur, but he always said, I'm weird in the fact that I pay myself first. But when I pay myself first, it goes right into the assets that I want to be going after. So the mind shift for me is like, listen, I could be you know, achieving more personal expenses and living a more lavish, comfortable lifestyle, or I could be kind of putting the building blocks for something that will maybe pay dividends 10, 20 years down the road. Um, And ultimately, in the end of the day, if something happens to me, I break my leg, I'm in a car accident, and I'm able to not be self-employed and run a business, I want something to be able to there to catch my fall. You know, I was never a nest egg guy, but I, I do now being married, I do want a small nest egg, five, 10, 15 grand, to have a way if there's an emergency. Yeah. Because if I run my entire business and I get hurt or fucked up, that's gone. Yeah. You know? So I want to have something there as far as that. I don't want to be... And now it's kind of my fuck you to the world, but I don't want to be owned by the banks or the creditors or <laughs> this or that. I want to just say, fuck you, and I'm going to use you to fly around the world, but I'm not going to use you to pay any type of interest on anything. I yeah. hate interest. And if I want interest, I want it to be appreciating, not, not paying for it. Um, so that's kind of where my perspective shift is now is, you know, as kids growing up, we always had this theory of like, if I want to pay for something, I got to have the cash shaved up to pay for it. Mm-hmm. And then I got introduced to my first credit card when I was 19, a Capital One Venture. And uh, I ran it up and I ran it up and I didn't pay it off because I didn't have the cash to pay it off. You know, I got a $6,000 credit limit on that card. And I thought it was $6,000 cash I basically had. My mindset was like, oh, cool. I could just swipe it and poof, money comes. (laughs) Um, I wasn't taught about, you know, I saw in the paper with 22% 
you know, interest rate on, on the balance. I didn't know what the interest rate was. I didn't, you know, yeah. what is that dude? He's like, I want a credit so, card. <laughs> so you're telling me if I have a thousand dollars and 22% is, I'm paying $220 in interest for what? For the money that I didn't fucking have, you know? So we live this lifestyle using money that's not ours, paying for shit that we don't own to impress who, you know? And that's where I'm at now in my life is like, listen, I would rather live like a peasant for the next five years and live poor. By living poor, I mean still living my, my normal lifestyle, but taking everything. Like, for instance, it's a thought I'm having. It's really tearing. I mean, for you business owners out there, I'm sure you either are at this point or not to it yet or, or you've gone past it. But now I'm on the, okay, how do I grow and expand my business point? You mm -hmm. know, And uh, say I make 100 grand a year. Next year, if I run the same amount of business, I want to give 50 of that away to hire an employee. How does that make sense? But if I hired 50 more that way employee, I could double my sales, and then I make 150 that year, not yes. 50 That's that year. That's the hardest move to make. So it's a hard move, and it takes balls. And yeah. I was talking to my wife about it, and we have very different personalities when it comes to risk and when it comes to liabilities and stress like that. Like, well, you're telling me I'm paying for someone's lifestyle, and, and they're depending on me, and there's a... A sense of stress that comes with that oh but to God. me it's excitement like oh i have to like like you oh i have to pay for my personal lifestyle i'm gonna make the money oh i gotta pay for this employee oh i gotta get the jobs what, what a motivation because if i don't get the jobs i'm fucking broke yo mm -hmm. and if i don't get the jobs i just told someone and shook his hand that he's got a job here for a year and he doesn't you know it's not just your family so, it's yeah. somebody else's family mm -hmm. so that's some a lot people, of responsibility there's a fire there and that bucket of stress is either water or it's gasoline and for me i find it as gasoline because that fires me up to some point yes. like oh i have an office space now that's a three thousand dollar a month thing that i don't want to pay for i could be working out of my home office but now it just appeals to a different clientele who some people are ritzy. They like the office. Some people like the Voss water. Some people like the coasters. You have to appeal to a different audience. And if I say, yeah, come to my home office, we'll sit at my kitchen table and I'll roll out the blueprints. It's not what they want, especially when you get to a certain tax bracket. You know, I was going to I was going to uh, amend what I said earlier, because I don't want people to be getting the wrong uh, advice if we're giving advice uh, and what I said earlier by increasing your lifestyle yeah. to give yourself motivation sure I did some of that uh, dirty lifestyle boost and getting yeah. the motorcycle and yeah. that that did do a kick in your ass yeah. but as I've grown what a better way of doing that is to be in reinvesting in yourself if you're, yeah. if you're gonna be doing something like that and kicking yourself in the ass keep putting the foot to the throttle on things that are progressing you yeah. mm -hmm. and and you'll still get that feeling but at least it's a feeling in a positive direction yeah. right. um, and uh, you were just saying something uh, Oh, fuck. Uh, I'm sorry. I like the point you're making right now, though. Like, if you get, for example, the credit card, you don't go and run it up on Yeezys and True Religion jeans. Yeah. You run no. it up on a brand new mower and weed whacker so you can take on more clients. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so, Not financial advice, by the yeah, way. Yeah. <laughs> None of this. Is. <laughs> the, um, but uh, when you were saying that, I, I think you were saying, like, uh, how you needed to advance, like, the, the new stepping stone. Like, that's yeah. always the worst part about being a business owner is trying to, you know, get past the second hump yep. almost. You maximize what you're capable of doing, yep. then you gotta go hire new people, then you gotta drop back to the lifestyle you had, you know, two years yeah. ago right. just on a roll of a of a dice, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and and that's extremely, extremely hard. And it's a risk that I feel like a lot of people have a hard time making because it's something that you don't necessarily have to do because you're in this comfort zone. You could technically stay right where you are now and be content with the hundred grand a year that you're making because there's nothing wrong with that, but there's just a cap to it, you know? Like, at, mm -hmm. at the stage that you're in, you know you, you've kind of maxed out the level that you're at and you're only going to be able to make this much money without hiring the new employees or going to that next step that you need to go to. But it's going to require sometimes, you know, dishing out a fat chunk of money or taking that pay cut to level up to that <coughs> next stage. Yeah. But that's where the potential is. Absolutely. And I think for some people that uh, it's two different characteristics, but some, the majority have a hard time understanding this perspective of, uh, I want to continue to push the limits. But to me, the way I interpret it is like, I don't have a comfort zone. I never truly get to a point where I'm like, made six figures, I'm chilling. Or mm -hmm. I make six figures and I'm like, okay, how can I make seven? Yeah. You know, like, how can I, how can I, you know, 
change other people's lifestyles like mine. So uh, who do I want to hire? Who, would I, who do who do I want to influence and, and, and help build this with? And um, so that's what really excites me now. But to me, uh, it'd almost be worse if I stayed stagnant. It'd almost be worse if Way I worse. made my six figures at my building, being a one-man show, doing my own thing, um, because I feel like I have this unlocked potential. And uh, uh, a quote that I just thought of, uh, David Goggins, he's an inspirational speaker, said it. But uh, he got asked a question on stage of like, what do you do in the moment where everything is telling you to, to, to stop, right? Uh, you're failing, you're, you're shitting the bed, things are happening. And he said, my answer is what if? What if it does work out? Mm -hmm. What if I do make the business? What if I, 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 I do build an asset in a portfolio? What if I am a great husband or a great father or a great father to an autistic son or what if? Yeah. And that's what fuels the whole thing is, there's so many negative thoughts that come to your mind of this isn't going to happen or this, this is going to fail or I'm going to fuck up. But what if it goes well? Mm -hmm. You know, what if you do succeed? And for some reason, that the, the connotation with what we're trying to do in society's perspective is what if it goes wrong? Everyone's perspective is what's going to go wrong? Everyone says that. You know, or, 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 kills or, me. What's going to fuck up or what's going to go, you know. And my thing is like, yeah, I get it. I think of those thoughts. Like, you'd be an idiot not to. But what if it goes well? You know, yeah. what if I do open, you know? And that doesn't mean I'm not preparing myself for the bullshit I'm going to face. But it's preparing it saying, I'm going to get through this because I know what if. Mm -hmm. And then I get to the next one, then I do what if, you yeah. know? So each one of these roadblocks get a little bit less because you know that it's going towards a common goal. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what you shoot for. Yeah. So... Uh, you're not weird if you want to continue to push the level of your life or you're hungry or, you know, my wife is very different than I, you know, she's like, she doesn't really understand the uncontentness and, and, uh, and sometimes she just seeing, you know, she's, we're, we're fairly successful, but she's like, why are you continuing to kill yourself and, and work so hard and come home and just drained? And I'm like, cause this ain't it, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not even there yet. And, yeah. uh, the what if of what we could be is what you know, that's my why you know yeah. and uh, what if i'm able to pay my mom's mortgage off and what if i'm able to do this and do that and see the world it just it just drives me crazy in a good way yeah. um so now with your your life right where do you see the next five years going five years uh, <laughs> so i i've made wild spreadsheets on that yeah. um no I, I literally got like a 10-year spreadsheet going on and it's it's disgusting yeah. too i got i got why it, it, i got macros in there yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it moves when i move digits um but i mean it's all up to you know what works out yeah. you know in the next six months or you know because like right now i'm working on so many you know large projects that you know one can pop off and it only takes that one to really change the fucking yeah. numbers um so i guess the the quick answer is that you know in the next five years what are we, 27 we're gonna be 32, 32. um well, I've already I've already put in so much heavy work on this next uh, venture of mine that I'd be devastated if something really good doesn't happen in the yeah. next like six months or so. Yeah. Um, but so I so I hopefully I, I run another large yeah. company. Uh, hopefully I employ a, a good amount of people, um, and I want so much to do something different. Yeah. Um, I don't want to just do, you know, I'm in insurance right now, right? There's yeah. not a lot of difference you can make in insurance. It's, it's what, they, what they call a red water industry. And they've been around for forever. L uh, lawyers, doctors, uh, 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 insurance, all these things are red water. And so um, if I am going to be involved in a red water industry, then I'd like to bring, you know, a big difference. Yeah. Uh, but I really would want to be in a really cool industry. I've, I've been steering towards tech a lot recently. Um, just out of necessity for you know the in the industry that I'm in, um, and I just want to do something cool. I don't I don't really like like just like you were saying like I don't really give about the money. Like yeah. I like I, I have the power for the money. Like I I know how to make it. I know how to duplicate it. I I, I know how to do those yeah. things. And so now I just I just want to like something a whole lot. Yeah. And so if I if I'm helping a lot of people, if I'm making a d decent amount of money to where you know I can have cool stuff and help people, those are all positives but i just want to be involved in something that i like you want to have a purpose a bigger purpose you know? yeah and, and that's something that i struggled with with construction because you're swinging a hammer what's your purpose you know or you're just building a house 
But to me, I think it's cool in my like dreamy way because uh, we work so hard. We, I don't know about you, but I envision what my future home is. I call it the Monte Carlo. Oh yeah. But uh, what what my what my end thing is on the Jupiter Inlet, on the water, two big boats in the backyard, big pool, my hot wife, just everything there, right? And I envision that so much, like every fucking day I do. Yes. Um, and I'm able to build that for people. Mm -hmm. That's what's really cool because all my clients are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, and they're getting to this point now where they want custom and they want it to their own. They want, you know, I've been, my entire life I wanted to walk into a bathroom. I have a switch right here, and I'm able to, yeah. you know, those little things like that. Um, so it's really cool. And then when you see the project come together and then walk in and kind of just say, yeah, yeah, this is it. This is, yeah. Yes. It's pretty cool. Gives you a lot of ideas. Hell too. yeah, yeah. Man. And, uh, it's exciting. It's hard building a house. Uh, I was thinking about the other day, you know, like, uh, I'm very, um, I'm very not stern, but you know, I press my clients for answers as far as finishes, like flooring and paint colors and trim. There's a thousand. Um, but you know how hard it is to like pick a tile. And like pick a can <laughs> color, and yeah, like I can imagine. you're you're very OCD too. It's gonna be yeah, very hard. It's gonna be for tough. You. Yeah. When, when a lot of options too. You're I'm gonna sure. put like 15 different lights on the wall because mm. there's a hundred lights. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's very hard. So I have a, a, some empathy in that fact. You know. I imagine it's also really hard to imagine when you're looking at like the little sample square. Yeah. What it's gonna look like on like the entire thing. You know, like it's, how do you imagine what the whole house is gonna look like when you're just looking at this little square? And, like, for instance, these walls here, this is, like, a light gray, but it almost looks blue. It looks blue, yeah. Yeah, so paint's crazy. There's paint school. Literally Man, just, how pissed would you be if you thought you picked gray and it turns out blue? I'd be a little oh, hot, a yeah. little yeah. hot. Um, but I almost like to encourage my people to go very fast. Well, not very fast. Don't think too much. But don't think too much. Like, look at a wall, boom, I like that one most, and then go. Yeah. You know, because when you actually start analyzing things, you're like, oh, shit, this is hard. Um, you said you want two big boats in the back, huh? Yeah. <laughs> What do you need two for? I want a Bahamas boy, and I want, like, a little sandbar guy. Oh, okay. You know. That's cool. Um, I, I really want a sport fish boat, but, like, how many bones is that? A lot. Uh, it, it's just, it's keep, really... Keep the target high. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pete's like, sweet. <laughs> I'll go to the Get Bahamas. a loan for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put it on the yeah. credit card. <laughs> I do have the gold Amex. Uh, By the way, I, I remembered... Uh, Remember when I, I had that stall period right there? Yeah, yeah. I remembered what I wanted to fucking okay, say. what was it? You were saying how, you know, so, uh, if you had, like, the nicer truck or yeah. the nicer, you know, the Voss water or whatever, like, that actually, you think it's a luxury, but actually, like, is essentially bringing you more money, Correct. right? I've had that a million times. Mm -hmm. yeah. People don't understand that at all. Like, I had a nice truck, and, like, uh, I was telling my fiance how I was going to grab, like, basically twice as expensive truck. Yeah. She's like, what the fuck do you need that for? I'm yeah. like, because when I show up to the client's house, yeah. I'm like, they're going to look at me. I'm already, I already got, you know, a 19-year-old face or some yeah, shit. Yeah, right. But when I roll up in the forty fifty thousand dollar $50,000 truck, they're going to be like, this kid fucking means business. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, do you think for a moment that because of the truck, I can delve up another $300 a month? Yeah. yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think right. so times yeah. a lot. Yeah, I'm like, right. so am I really losing money on buying, you know, on buying the truck or am I it's missing out on money? Yeah. So you, and you got to think about that in the sense of, you know, uh, perspective or like, uh, you know, like you got to, you got to think it's openly It's easy for like me that. because, for instance, I've signed $2 million with the jobs this year and I'm 26 years old. All my clients are over 60. If I'm a 60 year old and I'm a multimillionaire, am I hiring a 26 year old contractor? It's so... I Probably imagine it'd be so hard, but if you're sharp, yeah. you know well, what you're talking well, about. And here's what I told Pete. We did an episode on it. But what kills all criticism and all questioning is if you know your answers. Yes. If you know your shit. Like, like I've, when we, we said it on a podcast, it was like, they could think, wow, that kid's like a little ignorant or pretty cocky or whatever it is. But ignorant. he knew his shit. <laughs> you yeah. said ignorant yeah. really funny. Ign ignorant. Ignorant. <laughs> no, no you, don't, you don't say it right. <laughs> Shut up, dude. That kid's a little ignorant. Pete has a speech impediment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, random thought. Completely random. This is going to be absolutely out of the blue. Um, but I was in Publix today. Public bathroom. When was the last time you used the bathroom at Publix? Almost never, right? Not last week. It had to be a bad day. Well, I just had to go real bad. I had just come from the doctor. Got a big bag of fluids pumped into me. Tinkle? Um, yeah, just a tinkle. Yeah. It was a number one. It was a number yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. I would, you know me, I don't poop in public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you guys ever notice, like, in the men's bathroom, there's, like, almost always pubes on the urinal? There's always, like, some straight pubes on the urinal? Um, I don't think it... I don't, I don't 
No, Peter. No, no. come yeah. on. <laughs> you don't look down. There's always like fucking I mean, stray pubes on the urinal. I well, see some fucked up shit. Pubes are such an interesting discussion. Um, I, one of the thoughts I had a few weeks ago was... Well, hold on. Don't change it. You, <laughs> yeah. you, you've never noticed this? I mean, a pube or two. I'll yeah, say right. Well, yeah, there was two. Yeah, I'm not saying there's someone's bush well, laying two, in the urinal. Was it, were they right next to each other? No, they looked like they were actually probably from two different sources. Two different and I was views. thinking, like, <laughs> how do you determine that? <laughs> yeah, well, one was, like, real curly uh, and nappy, okay. and the other one wasn't, okay. you know? Okay. Um, but I was just kind of thinking, like, are people plucking them while they're here? Because no, I'm not just whipping it out and, like, hair is f- f- falling oh, out yeah. of my pants as yeah, I'm yeah. pulling my wang out, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How do they end up there? Well, and it's not just the public's bathroom. I feel like anytime I use a urinal, you can. O- you guys are going to notice now, unless you're using like a pristine bathroom yeah, yeah, or yeah. something. And Publix isn't necessarily a dirty place. No. But if you look in the urinal, there's like almost always a pube in there. Well, maybe the pubes are there. You know, uh, on guys, how we have that weird thing like where you have to move one thing over, move the other thing over, and then take your dick out to pee? You okay. have flaps? Uh, you know, like the old school boxer briefs? Where you, you use the have- slit? I use a slit. <laughs> really? Yeah. You use the boxer slit? That's what it's there for. <laughs> oh my god, I just pull everything down. That's weird. No, I don't think so. I think, I don't know. Are you yeah, the no. first person I know that uses the slit? Yeah. yeah. Zip down, peek, boo. You and... use the zipper too? Yeah, no, I don't unbutton. Oh my oh. god. Yeah. No, I yeah. think you're the unicorn here. Well, yes. I, uh, I'm about quickness and accessibility, Peter. <laughs> There's nothing quick about that. Zip, it, how I'm quick is it boom. to just go like this and pull everything down? Well, then right. I'm exposing myself a wee bit, yeah? I mean, it was designed that way. I just don't know why. Right, I, I understand would, yeah, that's its purpose. I mean, purpose. why is there a fucking zipper, Peter? Yeah, yeah, it's its purpose, but like, it's you know, not quick or efficient. And it's crazy to think that pants used to be just buttons. You know, the a whole pant would button. Yeah, that. You know, when did the zipper come along? And that that's a crazy so, question too. Someone had to go someone had an issue. and they couldn't fucking get the buttons yeah. undone quick and they wet themselves. You know, in middle school, did you guys have a no hoodie rule? No, we had no uh, dress code at Bach. Really? We got to wear anything we wanted because it was an art school. You got to be able to did express you, yourself. Did you dress yeah. like down or up to school? I wore Under Armour shorts and Under Armour t-shirt every single day. Really? Yeah, my dad used to think I was a fucking weirdo. He used to like wear red <laughs> a lot. Uh, how would you know? <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I was just sexy I I, and red. I wear, like, black Under Armour shorts every day, and then whatever color Under Armour shirt I picked. That Besides day. black, what's your favorite color to wear? Uh, I mean, you know me. I wear black pretty much every, every day, day now. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a colored shirt? Uh, sometimes I wear gray, but I don't wear it on the podcast anymore because I wore a gray shirt on our first episode, and I sweat too much, and you could uh, see it. So okay. now wow. I just wear black. Okay. Um, and that's about it. But, like, if you catch me tattooing, sometimes you'll find me in a gray shirt. Hmm. I don't yeah. wear white anymore because they all have tattoo ink splatters on them. Uh, it's kind of That's weird. why I wear the black, I think, is because everything has tattoo ink on mm. it. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the other question I had was, um, do you, after you fart, do you sniff for it? I'm going to ask this before, but... Um, yeah. Do you sniff for it? I, I usually yeah. don't have to try real hard, but yeah. You got bad farts? Yeah, dude. I was. Really? It's funny that you asked this because that was also added to my notes today. Do you like fart a lot? Because I fart a lot. Some days, <laughs> some days I do. Some days I'm like, well, I had a lot of fiber. I had two day. protein shakes yesterday, mm-hmm. and today has been a bad day. Really? Yeah. Like long farts too. Yeah, I've got like vocal farts. Really? And like, thank God I'm in one of those. Uh, my relationship with JoJo is strong enough where like I can just fart in front of her, mm-hmm. and I mean she doesn't like it. Do you say like, excuse me? I say, excuse me. If I know it's a real bad one, I say, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so fucked. Now, if you're tattooing someone's, let's say... No, you know, I hold oh. it in. I don't do it while tattooing. Yeah, have you no? ever got somebody no, no. on the You've table? You've never that... farted on a tattoo? No, no, no. Ever? Never, no. I find that hard to believe, Peter. No, I'll, I'll like take a break and go to the bathroom and then do it in the bathroom. And just so. fart in the bathroom? That's a true yeah, professional yeah. Oh, right there. this was one of them. Bro, I'm not going to make someone suffer in the room with yeah. you like that, dude. I would do it a little bit. There's dude. only two of us in the room. They know it wasn't them, so it had to be me. You know? Just dirty Sanchez. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's not what a dirty Sanchez is. <laughs> You know what the worst feeling in the world is, though? When you're a guest at someone's house and you, you, you had a poop so bad. So you go to take a poop, and then you go to reach for the toilet paper, and there's none. Oh, and hell then you, no. And then you look in the vanity, and there's none. Oh. Have that ever happened to you before? Yeah, it had to have, I'm sure. And it's the worst feeling in the world, because what do you do? You know, you typically what I would do is you I would... use the hand towel. <laughs> no, I take my underwear off. I use that, and then I put there. it in their trash can. Yep, yep. <laughs> 
Yeah. 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 Got, no way. Because have you actually done that? Kudos before? to me because fuck them. They should have access <laughs> toilet paper somewhere. Wet wipes. Give me an alternative. Um, have you actually well, done you that left, before? 100%. You left the evidence behind. Yeah, right. Then they go to take out the trash a week later and they're like, it smells like shit in here. Yeah. <laughs> Who's SpongeBob boxers in <laughs> 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 That's so true. I didn't think about that. No, <laughs> yeah, you've, been, you've been caught many times. No one ever uses this guest bathroom. <laughs> yeah. Oh wait, Nick did come yeah, over yeah, last week. Yeah. Too fat shit. <laughs> <laughs> and wrote like an "I'm sorry" note on top of it. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Have you actually done that before? What? Wiped your ass with your boxers yes. because no one had toilet paper. No, I have a rough pass, Peter. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's pretty wild. To the puke thing. Um, I can't believe you guys are acting like you don't know what I'm talking about. No, sometimes I'll see it on like a Someone comment seat. below and support me here, please. Yeah. I know it you guys know weird, what I'm Peter. talking about. Um, do you, have, you guys ever use You're going to notice it now. Do you ever use the tissue that's there to lay on the seat? No, I don't poop in public. We've This was episode number one we talked about. You this. might poop in some airports now because they have this rotational thing. <laughs> Ooh. Because it's plastic. So every time someone sits up, the plastic rotates. So you oh. get new plastic on the seat every time. Down for that. Where's the thing go? What do you mean? It just disappears into somewhere. I don't understand the physics behind it, Peter. All I'm saying is... New, That's cool. It could be in... It could just be in a circular it's just rotation. revolving. Yeah. There's like... There's little brushes on it. That thing. That's cool. pretty smart. That's cool. Question of pubes. Um, have you ever reached down in your pubes and pulled out like an eight-inch hair? And you're like, where'd that come from? Um, Please say yes. Not down there, no. I do have some of those randomly on my body. Like, I've got two on my neck that randomly are like wicked long. But you've never done that out of your balls or anything like that? Have you, Chandler? Uh, well, <laughs> no... Pube wise, yeah. but I will tell you there is something weird. Every time I've ever had like a a sexual like experience, like my my fiance, mm -hmm. swear to God, every single time I can find one of her hair like in my balls somewhere, oh, yeah. somewhere. I don't know where I, I don't know where she didn't have to go down on me or anything. Been doing it's it like that. there. And yeah. It's kind of fucking weird. I, yeah. I still can't figure it out. She's planted in there on purpose. Well, maybe they're. I mean, they're embedded. Yeah. So because I, that's what throws me off. Is this Paige's hair or is this mine? <laughs> is this a ten-year-old pube that I just missed yeah. and it's wrapped around my balls? No, you just I'm have not, one I'm not follicle. I've pulled out a hair hard. this long from that area. Wow. Holy that's, shit! No that's way. Crazy. There's no way. I swear. I swear. You know, I'd say somewhere about that. I would that. save that. Well, that's a little weird, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, don't even shave it. Just, just keep put, that one there. Just keep put it in going. my toilet every time. <laughs> um, Leave that one on the urinal and have someone be really confused it, next time they use it. That thing's attached? <laughs> <laughs> Are you, sh you sure? You've got one overactive follicle. Well, I'll be honest, follicle. every time it happens... <laughs> Every time it happens, which is about like once a quarter, um, it, it does like it pulls from somewhere. So I think it might have wrapped around or something, because at some point I do feel like a little yank. You know, yeah. I don't know if that's yank. So I don't know, right? Don't judge me. What I'm getting at is, I well, think Paige it's not, is blonde. It would be pretty easy to tell. Yeah, you're sure, right. Sure. But I know strawberry blonde. Who knows? Um, but uh, with us being in consistent relationships, how often are you guys grooming down there? You know? Not that often anymore. Yeah. About once a month or? Maybe twice. Maybe twice? How about I you? use the trimmer too. All the time. Not even oh, yeah? You know, you know who actually got... Blake got me into that. What? <laughs> I don't know. We're, we're, <laughs> regular yeah, no, I mean like... <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna ask you about no, that. no, no, no. Well, well, it was... I mean, you know, obviously, you know, I grew up and yeah. we're, we're talking about things like, you know, oh, do you, do you sure. shave? You sh and we're all trying to figure this out. Yeah. And I remember it just being the weirdest thing that Blake was like, yo, dude, I fucking baby that shit. Like, it is oh, yeah. clean, clean. And I thought it was the weirdest fucking thing, but he put a lot of sense into it. He's yeah. like, oh, man, you know, because now you got, like, a clean landscape. They can go anywhere they want. Right. Like, and I'm like, all right, bet. Like, so now. It, Just yeah, a standard. All, all the way up to here. Yeah. I mean, every three days, four And you're going days, clean like, shave? Clean shave, everything. What? Yeah, like clean, clean. Wow. Yeah. So I'll like once a month do the clean shave mm -hmm. and then probably hit it with the trim again like another time at some point in the month. And then that's about all the manscaping I do. I have to ask. And then my face is kind of the same way. I'll do like one clean shave a month and then mm -hmm. one trim zip, a month. Zip, zip, and that's about yeah. it. When you got pregnant. Not with the same uh, <laughs> trimmer. <laughs> we get it, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Just to clarify. He likes pubes. Um, <laughs> when you uh, got pregnant twice in like six months or whatever it was, eight months, sure. were you guys using any type of protection at all? No. Is that, uh, 
God, you're making me expose everything here. Um, no, actually, uh, so we uh, had one night where we, we busted, no protection or whatever. Best feeling in the and, world. Yeah, best, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and we were just like, oh, well, you know, we were scared for like two weeks. Nothing happened. Then we took a plan B. Then we did it again and After again. two weeks, you took a plan B? Yeah. Like, Does it work that way? I don't I think, think so, like but it made day. us it made us feel better. <laughs> yeah. like that's and plan uh, B. <laughs> we we did it for a, like I don't know like six months straight. And like anybody like look this shit up, like this is bad for you. You do not do this. And so um, actually, we were fucking raw for like two years. Uh-huh. And I'm talking like, dude, we like on, having sex. She like has, she's on no birth no birth, control. no birth control at all. Oh, two man. years. You, you popped your plan B and like you know. No no no. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Okay. Plan B was only for a couple months. Oh, and then after that, we were and just like, "Fuck it," like you know, okay, like, happens, whatever. And but but the weird thing was, it dude. I mean, we were going like oh. yeah, six months hit, eight months, a uh, year, and mm-hmm. nothing happened. And we were like, "Okay, maybe one of us is infertile." I don't know what's going on, but it's not happening. Mm-hmm. And so it was actually really random how you know she got pregnant after those two years because it just came out of nowhere. Like wow. I'm talking like busting like twice a day, like two okay. years, okay. like. Wow. We, we thought we were for sure like infertile like and uh the and plan b was just still flowing in her system well now that we do a little bit more research into it, i guess it, it does mess up some kind of you know the reproductive you yeah. know stuff so more than likely that's what was causing it um but i mean for a while there we thought we weren't having kids like at wow. all like, wow so so you were setting yourself up to possibly have a child but yeah, yeah but were you like trying I mean, it almost sounds like no, you were we were no, no, no. We we were we just weren't caring. You weren't it, not, just, not trying. It yeah. was just just like uh, just I mean, just like when you stop using condoms, yeah. you know, like you start doing that, mm. then then you're like, okay, I can't go back now. Yeah. And then you know you get Once away you, with it those first couple times, and then you get in a real fucking loop, and like yeah. that's just a bad loop. No, no, no one get into that loop because it's a. Once you die, you can't go back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. While we're back on this topic. What when you guys first got pregnant? What stage in the relationship were you guys in? Like, were you guys living together at that point? How long? We, had, how long had you guys been together? We were with each other for just a couple years, maybe two, three years. Oh, I want to okay. say. Yeah. And were you living like together? That. Yeah, yeah. We, we we were living with each other within like the first year, but that was just uh, off circumstance because we both went to the same college. Mm-hmm. And so you know, when we started going to the same college, where you know we both got dorms, yeah, and yeah. so we just sleep at each other's dorms, and right. we got an apartment. Um, so, uh, but no, then when she got pregnant, like, uh, we moved back, back over to Palm beach and she was definitely living with me yeah. at that time. Quick, so. a random question, but like, which sex do you think it has more ill intent socially men or women? Like what percentage of guys who are in marriages compared to girls who are in marriages or girls in relationships or guys in relationships? Do you think more men than women are going out with ill intent or women than men? What do you mean by that? Yeah. Like, I think that there's this perception of men are always the one that cheat or men are the always ones that treat the woman bad or abuse the woman. Uh. But I think that women do it a lot. It just seems so much more uh, secure and, you know, they do it in a more professional sense, you know. Mm. But I, I just think that sometimes... Uh, the sneakiness behind some women and like the way they go about things is weird. So my question was like, do you think more when than women go out on a Saturday night with partners at home and try to do dirty shit? I think statistically it probably still falls within men. Men, Yeah. Um, Just because I think I I'm still in the belief that, you know, uh, uh, women going out and cheating is like a much uh, higher, uh, it's more mental than it is physical. Yeah. Phys- you know, men are just trying to go get, you know, go fuck. Yeah. Like, women, like, they can fuck whoever they want. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, they, they see a homeless dude walking by. Like, hey, you want to fuck? Like, they're going to be like, yeah, I want to fuck. That's true. So That's when, insane. Yeah. yeah. So when they're choosing to, to go fuck, it's a it's a real, like, ass yeah. decision, you know. Um, so uh, so I, th- I think just statistically it has mm-hmm. to be the, the guys but not not dismissing the, the bad girls out there sure. like, and to go funny. back to the original question and to change it like the verbiage back to ill intent and instead of just cheating i think it's swayed a little bit more towards women in the last few years because of that same reason and like the way social media is 
maybe girls aren't like physically doing the dirt of like cheating mm-hmm. as often, but they're but they've cheating. got the backup yeah. plan on standby. Yeah, more often than not, yeah. you know, yeah. because of how easy it is for them to do so. They've got dudes in their DMs every day who they've been entertaining those messages, be just in case you know their boyfriend starts acting up and wants to do some fuck shit then they're ready to do some yeah. fuck shit right back, you know? So they may yeah. not actually go out on Saturday night and cheat because then they're going to get called a slut or be, like, shamed, you know, socially. But as soon as they have, uh, like, the opportunity to be single or it is socially acceptable to do something, they're fucking ready to go. Yeah. You know? I yeah. think a lot of girls have that plan B ready to go. And yeah, well, not, it, not the plan B we were just talking about, but <laughs> yeah. the, the backup plan. <laughs> And I mean, and and they have they have so many options. It's like, it's not even against them at that point. Like they just yeah. that's just their reality. Yeah. That it is so easy. I mean, if Kinda, you had, don't give them too much better. I mean, I'm just, I'm trying to be devil's advocate oh, yeah. <laughs> a little if, bit. If you're if you're like a fairly good looking girl, I mean, even if you up to a guy like me who's taken, I mean, I'll be kind to you back. But if you're a guy that goes up to a girl, half of them will be bitches to you. Absolutely. You know. And if you walked up to a guy and I turned around and said, excuse me, why are you talking to me? Um, <laughs> that's like, dude, what's his issue, yeah. you know? Like, who punched him in the face? But I feel like if you went up to a girl and did that, you're like, all right, well, she just doesn't want to talk to me. You, you know, it's like somewhat of the norm. Yeah. So I think there's this different perception. And like, I don't know. It just was getting to me the other day that I think, you know, sometimes women don't get called out on their shit as much. Um, I think that's true. But yeah. I, I think it's pretty equal. Yeah. There's a lot of dudes doing dirt out there, but there's a lot of chicks doing yeah, dirt yeah, out yeah. there. Yeah. It's uh, all circumstantial. This is true. Well, that was a hell of a roller coaster. Um, <laughs> Chandler, I've, I've still got something for you. Go ahead. What's the best advice that Joe, the million dollar man, has ever given you? It's a great question. Mm-hmm. Um, the best advice he ever bestowed upon me was probably the fact that there is a millionaire and billionaire in every single category. And so, so many people get uh, kind of caught up on the, uh, you know, what am I going to be? What am I going to do? I mean, is it going to be insurance? Is it going to be this, that, that? Like, who am I? And what am I going to do to be the guy that I want to be? Mm-hmm. And what he kind of did was alleviate that for myself because he said, look at the world he's like there is a millionaire selling tvs there is a billionaire you know selling uh, the the trash king of new york billionaire trash king of new york he's like it really isn't about you know you can literally choose any vehicle that you want they're all going to make it to california so just pick one like Mm -hmm. you know it and it it relieves a lot of the stress of you know oh i gotta be a doctor i gotta be a lawyer i gotta be and uh and that was probably the most impactful thing that he ever said to me because at the time in my life um, that was a big question for myself was, you know, who who am I? What am I going to do? I think a lot of people deal with that. And mm-hmm. so, you know, it's so true. It's, it's yeah. I mean, y- you can be the bill- billion dollar landscape guy. You can, because guess what? The guy who does run the billion dollar landscape company. Wants forget, to sell it. He, what? He wants to sell it. <laughs> he wants to sell it probably, the billion dollar. Like someone's always acquiring something. Yeah, yeah. well, but, but like he started with a truck, yeah, you know, yeah, like, right. like he started from somewhere. And so, you know, in that same mentality, why not you? Yeah, and, sure. and so the opportunity is always going to be there, whether you want to sell pillows or lights or you want to be in construction, you want to be in real estate, you to, whatever you want to do, mm-hmm. you can be the billion dollar guy in that category. And so it alleviates a lot of the pressure. And I think that was probably the best thing he ever nice. told me. I love yeah. that. On that same token, though, what confuses me a little is because with saying that, I would assume that you did landscaping. Now you'd be the billionaire landscaping guy. Sure. But you did landscaping and then, you know, you got into insurance and then now you're looking at other ventures. So my question is, are we jumping ventures to get on the faster vehicle to California? Or are we jumping ventures because this venture um, is not necessarily faster, but it's going to fulfill me more? You know, how, how do we pick that? Yeah, so the, uh, you hit, him, hit him with a lot of great questions. But so, uh, yeah, so it originally was the billion dollar landscape guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but another thing that he poised to me was he said, you know, Theoretically, you know, there are, you know, faster vehicles. And he's like, uh, you know, while they'll all get you to California, it takes, you know, this much of knowledge to hop into a faster vehicle. And by the way, there's just as many 
of these fast vehicles as there are slow vehicles. Mm-hmm. So the, the the original thing that you said was still true, and you can still choose. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like like and so uh, so anyways, finance you know is the number one uh, creator of millionaires. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, they say real estate a lot of the times, but it's it's finance, mm-hmm. and finance is a broad spectrum. I mean, you can be a banker, you can do stocks, you can do uh, insurance on the very off. So I knew that I at least wanted to be a part of that winning squad. Um, and it just so happened that one of my strong connections uh, was the guy with the uh, largest in- insurance agency or largest independent insurance agency in the state of Florida. And uh, he was a guy that I really uh, looked up to. He was a very smart uh, guy that you'd run into battle with. And so um, I just got involved in that and uh, I found a lot of positives about it because I, I really thought about it deeply. One of the things that I really didn't like about landscaping in particular was the fact that you know, I was, uh, I took a trip to uh, France, right? And uh, the entire time I was in France, I was staring at my phone, just like, like getting problems lined up with all these, you know, uh, landscape crews, the truck broke, this and that. And I, I just felt the money getting burned the fuck out of my, my hand. And I couldn't do anything about it because I was far away. It required me to be in person to do those operations, right? Or effectively. Insurance is not like that. You're selling PDF documents. And so uh, the lure of insurance to me was it gave me the freedom to do, you know, be wherever I wanted to do, you know, uh, do whatever I wanted to do. It, the, the freedom that you want when you become that billionaire that has the time to fly around everywhere, I could get that through insurance. Mm-hmm. And so, or just in the financial services category. And so that lured me to it. I had a really good role model in the space. Um, and I have a really good team around me mm-hmm. that I enjoy working with. Um, and so now uh, that's what la- that's what's landed me into insurance um but 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 the shiny the shiny object syndrome always happens i mean i'm always looking at cool other you know verticals um but you also you know you'll get lost in that so you gotta you gotta sit down somewhere it's a hard gray area to find between looking always looking for opportunities and you know like to the car analogy in my brain honestly say you're driving a toyota camry and this guy drives by you in a ferrari but then he jumps from that Ferrari to a Porsche. But in that jump, he waits about two years because he's actually taking a step back because he's in another vertical. Mm-hmm. And then the Porsche picks up. Yeah. Well, why don't I just drive my Ford, you know, continuously straight? That's something that always pulls at me. And I'm not saying yeah. I disagree with what you're saying. What yeah. I'm saying is like <clears throat> sometimes with my ADD and my always looking for opportunities, I'm like, oh, well, that guy just talked to me about a six sales position. Or I have clients who have offered stuff because they know – my work ethic and whatnot. And I'm like, wow, I could be the lead of this sales region and I'd be making a quarter million and what's the ceiling on that? Mm -hmm. But then I do that and then that's into another world I don't know and there's gonna be problems and issues. So I'm not saying it's stagnant, but it's definitely a slower step and then you do it in a slower step. So it's hard for me because it tugs at me, right? Like I'm on this vehicle that's, I know where it's going in my heart. Could take five, 10, 20 years to get there, but I know that I'm gonna push it there. Or I continue to jump to these verticals that look shiny and bright. Who knows? The Porsche looks shiny and bright. What's under the hood? You know, and so that's what gets in my head sometimes where it's like, just keep chugging away, chugging away, chugging away. Don't quit. And if you don't quit, you're going to be successful at it, you know? If I had if I had to uh, redo my decisions, right, by hopping yeah. industries like that, what I would do differently is instead of having that shiny object like again i I made a very strategic plan and i think i did it appropriately but what i would have done more is when i looked at all those shiny objects instead of looking at them as something i needed to go hop into i would have taken the shiny aspects of them and brought them over into the place that i was operating in so you kind of do it both ways where you know there's in other industries they're, they're doing some things very correctly you know like like very well and those same you know practices can be applied to your industry that may have not been applied previously and so i would take those and bring them into your industry Mm -hmm. and keep pushing at what you're doing and that's that's kind of how i would attack it nowadays because yeah. now i'm really sat in my industry and i i don't think that my, me hopping something else is going to produce any kind of wilder results but i do constantly go to conventions of different uh industries i mean just for the fuck of it like mm-hmm. you know because there's always something that i'll find and i'll be like whoa what the fuck i'm like why why don't we have this insurance why, why aren't we utilizing this technology it, it fits perfectly you know they're just marketing it to mortgage or yeah. whatever else and so um that's what i would do differently now 
And the, the reason I drive the question is because I know a lot of people, especially our age in the late 20s, they're deciding which vertical to really go down. You know, I'm okay-ish happy in the job I am. I make okay-ish money. Do I want to risk that okay-ish life and I know what I'm getting and jump to an industry I have no clue? Do I want to become a personal trainer at a gym or leave the state for this random opportunity in North Carolina because it looks cool? You know, and like... I know it pulls out a lot of people because, like, do I try to open and do my own thing because I'm in my late 20s and I don't have a kid yet? Like, when is the right time to do anything? And what I would just say is, like, just start doing something, you know, uh, working on something, reading books. Like my, my wife is really interested in, in either planning or decorative stuff, like uh, decorating houses and whatnot. I said, buy a book and read it. If you have no interest in any of the shit they're saying, it's going to be mad boring and don't go into it. But if you find, like, compelling things in there then that's your heart saying yeah look into it and keep um, digging correct so like you're saying um it's not necessarily switching but looking at different verticals and seeing what you could take in in, in you know input into your life start as a side gig and then if it comes a full-time gig then make that your full-time job um but it, it's it's just something so interesting to me because I know it, it, a lot of people think about that shit especially our age you know what am I doing professionally it's, it's, huge. it's huge um and uh, it excites me. I have one more thing on uh, what you just said. Um, fuck. My brain is meatballs. <laughs> um, no worries. Let me tell you another thing Joe told me. Yes. Yeah. Um, so another, so no, another thing that he, want, he wanted to really kind of impre- impress upon me was that um, so one of the biggest objectives when you're you know starting a business is getting customers, right? Mm-hmm. And so he told me that there was only a few metrics that he would need um, to essentially on, on a notepad scale out an entire business. And one of the main metrics was something called a customer acquisition number. And so you know do, doesn't matter what uh, you know industry vertical you know thing that you're doing right now. Um, he really tried to drive home the fact that you need to have metrifiable, scalable uh, uh, data. S- data. And by doing that, what you could do is you could put out a probe or an advertisement, right? Like, and do a micro probe and see what it returns. And so you would get a customer acquisition number off a very small probe test. Mm-hmm. And once you got a campaign that worked efficiently or gave you a positive ROI, you would just double down on that and roll and then move on to your next campaign and your next campaign because you know every time you insert $10, it pops out $100. Yeah. And the, uh, that that one dynamic was what he said separated those uh, mil- the, the local millionaires to the, to the national yeah. guys. He said, when you understand that concept, if that's your mission, is to keep getting positive campaigns going, positive processes, because you remember, a campaign could be a business-to-business type yeah. campaign. Um, or it could be a paid advertiser. It could yeah. be a billboard. All mediums make sense at a certain price point. And so he just tried to push upon me that it doesn't take a lot of money to get that math down. The math is super important. And once you get that number, how much it costs you to get a customer, he's like, then you can go light speed. Yeah, because so, then you could quantify everything. Yep. I love that. That's actually brilliant. I'm yeah. going to definitely take that to what I'm – because it's hard, like you saying, okay, I want more business. Do we double down on Google ads? Do we, you know, uh, try this, try that? Facebook leads, Instagram, where do you go? Um, I mean, I don't have a website. I don't have anything. All of our work is word of mouth. I get random calls. I pick it up, and it's a new client. Um, So my, I think what I'm really feeling good about is if I take that level of what I know now with social media with the podcast, and I take that level of hospitality, what I learned in four years serving, and I create kind of this whole environment where I'm able to go from the media route when I meet you in person, what I could bring to the table there, and then ultimately our product. Um, I'm just confident in what that could bring. You know? Absolutely. Because like you said, what always keeps me up in it is if not me, then who? Yes. You know, If There's... not me, then who? And that's what, bro, I gave a speech. I'm weird. I gave a speech to myself the other night. So as I'm doing this, I'm literally saying, bro, what is that 26-year-old kid who's the contractor who's going to be the next billionaire contractor doing that I'm not? Please show me him because I am trying to do every fucking possible thing I can. And I go to bed at night so confident in what I'm going to bring to the world because I don't know what the fuck else I could be doing. Um, so that type of confidence of like where I'm going, I don't know. Show me him. Let me see what he's doing so I could fucking do it. And that's kind of where I'm at. Um, so that's what fires me up. If, like, if not Pete, then who is the next 
tattoo artist of like the world. Who is yeah. the best tattoo artist? And where was he when he was 27? I want to meet him at yeah. 50 and ask him what the fuck he did. Um, yeah. Because I believe in him that much. And ultimately, if people wants to become the best tattoo artist in the world, he can. He could be doing the $20,000 sessions on Kevin Hart. I mean, that'd be sick. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you want to do that, but cool. Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, Chandler, your story is amazing, man. Uh, really what you've been able to cultivate and what you've been able to do for yourself from nothing is inspiring. Uh, I think you guys could take that. He probably had a, a lower bottom floor than you where you are now in life. I mean, he had a kid. He was 20 years old. He was broke. He had no clue where to go. And he started it from nothing. And he's doing pretty successful now. So I'm so happy for you, man. It's, it's um, looking positive. Yeah. <laughs> Excited to see where these uh, next five years. Yeah. Next year yeah, yeah. yeah. It could go totally sideways. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's part of the game. Let I me mean, see the Excel spreadsheets. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, you'll love them. Um, so shout cool. out your, your wife, uh, is your, your fiance. Fiance. And yep. your kids real quick. What are their names? Uh, Fallon, my okay. fiance. And then I got my two kids, Everly and Peyton. I love um, the name Fallon. I love the name Everly, and love the, that's like good names across the board. <laughs> we we tried really hard. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> we 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 both had unique names, so we yeah, were like, okay, yeah. well, we liked how that turned out, so let's give it to the kids. And now Everly is is, is a girl. Yes. Or, okay. Yep. Um, you know, with names these days, sometimes you shoot out names. You're like, because Everly could be a girl or a guy. I, yeah. I Chan- so. Chandler is a yeah, girl and true. guy name. Right. So yeah. Any, anything else you want to plug? I don't know. You mean like plug like a uh, promote shout out? I mean my company Insurance yeah, yeah. Insurance Express. Okay. Um, that's the one that we've been talking about this whole time. Yeah. I have a lot of cool things coming out with it, so hopefully people get to see it. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's all hush hush right now. So you, yeah. you'll see it, you'll see it in a couple yeah. months, cool. and hopefully it's really cool. Your next uh, gets I just to- uh, yeah. spoke with Garrett, dude. You guys are gonna fucking blow. Like, like <laughs> you're gonna love Garrett. That's Garrett's sick. fire. Awesome. We're stoked yeah. for that. Yeah. So no, man. We appreciate your time. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You got no, that's it, man. No, it's all love, bro. All right, guys. This is Chandler. Thank you guys so much for watching this week's Millennial Mentality. We will see you guys next week. Peace. Peace. That's like getting money, I'm on my thug again Tryna stack a little dub, tryna catch a win And next time I drop a coupe, it's gonna be a twin turbo Always been a G, but I ain't never been a herd though